I want you to turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 35. Don has read today from Exodus 25, and I want to begin by reading in 35 as we consider today uh, the erection of the tabernacle, or in other words, the construction of the tabernacle and what that looks like and all of the materials that are involved. Uh, are you going to get some more? Are we out of them? There must be the ones at Keys Fair. We started with about 60 here this morning. So, all right. How many of you still wanted them? Hold your hand up. All right, listen, we'll have them for you next week if they're not here or Wednesday. Um, and I'll order, order more. This will be 200 and something. But praise the Lord, you've got them. Have, those of you that have got it, have you not found it to be a pretty cool tool? It's giving you a lot of information in short form. And so I hope you're enjoying that. But uh, let's look at uh, Ezekiel 35, and I want to begin reading in verse 4. Excuse me, Exodus. I'm, I'm thinking of something else. You see, when you're driving down the road and your mind gets on something else, I was thinking about something in Ezekiel. Hallelujah. Just testing you. Ha <laughs> ha. You passed. No more, Elvis? Okay, thank you. All right, let's get serious here. Exodus 35 and verse 4. Moses said to the whole Israelite community, This is what the Lord has commanded. From what you have, take an offering for the Lord. Everyone who is willing is to bring to the Lord an offering of gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and fine linen, goat hair, ram skins dyed red, and hides of sea cows, acacia wood, olive oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil, and for the fragrant incense, and onyx stones and other gems to be mounted on the ephod and the breastplate. Look down to verse 20. Then the whole Israelite community withdrew from Moses' presence, and everyone who was willing and whose heart moved him came forward and brought an offering to the Lord for the work on the tent of meeting, for all its service, and for the sacred garments. All who were willing, men and women alike, came and brought gold jewelry of all kinds, brooches, earrings, rings, and ornaments. They all presented their gold as a wave offering to the Lord. Everyone who had blue, purple, or scarlet yarn, or fine linen, or goat hair, Ram skins dyed red or hides of sea cows brought them. Those presenting an offering of silver or bronze brought it as an offering to the Lord, and everyone who had acacia wood for any part of the work brought it. Every skilled woman spun with her hands and brought what she had spun, blue, purple, or scarlet yarn, or fine linen. And all the women who were willing and had the skill spun the goat hair. The leaders brought onyx stones and other gems to be mounted on the ephod and breastpiece. They also brought spices and olive oil for the light and for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense. All the Israelite men and women who were willing brought to the Lord freewill offerings for all the work the Lord through Moses had commanded them to do. Then go down to chapter 36, and we'll read in verse 3 and following. They received from Moses all the offerings. This is the workers. They received from Moses all the offerings the Israelites had brought to carry out the work of constructing the sanctuary, and the people continued to bring free will offerings morning after morning. So all the skilled craftsmen who were doing all the work on the sanctuary, they left their work, and they said to Moses, the people are bringing more than enough for doing the work of the Lord commanded to be done. And then Moses gave an order, and they sent this word throughout the camp. No man or woman is to make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. And so the people were restrained from bringing more because what they already had was more than enough to do all the work. The people were giving so much that the workmen said, tell them to stop. We've got way more than we need to accomplish the task. 
Wouldn't that be amazing if that was often what we heard uh, inside the walls of the house of God? Stop bringing, we've got plenty, uh, and let's divert to something else. Well, today we're going to talk about specifically erecting the tabernacle and God's pattern for its erecting and God's provision for its erecting. When it comes to God's pattern, it is both a heavenly pattern and it is an orderly pattern. When it comes to provision for the erecting of the tabernacle, the materials are from donations from among the people of all the different materials, but also we have to notice the diversity of the materials that are brought. Stephen Olford, in his work on the tabernacle, uh, he has said the story of the erection of the tabernacle is one not only of spiritual significance, but also of scientific magnificence. It is the record of a building that was perfect in every detail. Once completed, get a load of this, once completed, the tabernacle never again required attention, addition, or alteration. So carefully and durably was it constructed that the tabernacle lasted nearly 500 years, including 40 years in the wilderness. The only explanation for uh, an erection of this quality is that God was behind its conception as well as its construction. No repairs had to be made. For 500 years, everything was, was in order and everything was maintained. So when we think about God's pattern for the erecting of the tabernacle, first of all, it's heavenly. Both the Old and the New Testament make it abundantly evident that the pattern for the tabernacle was heavenly and therefore also orderly. God's instructions to Moses in Exodus 25 uh, were, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. The tabernacle appears to have been an exact replica of something which already existed in heaven. It is certainly plainly stated that Moses saw it, for in Hebrews 8, 5, it says, they serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow of that which is in heaven. And so the same pattern was later shown to the apostle John when he was exiled on the Isle of Patmos, for we discover in the book of Revelation that there also is an altar of sacrifice, chapter 6, verse 9. There is a sea of glass, chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. There are golden candlesticks, chapter 1, verse 12. There is a golden altar, chapter 8, verse 3. There is hidden manna, chapter 2, verse 17. And there's the ark of the testimony, chapter 11, verse 19. So one thing of what we're quite sure is that the conception and construction of this tabernacle was not the product or the plan of man, but rather of God himself. There are three chapters containing full and precise instructions for the erecting of the tabernacle. That's Exodus 25 through Exodus 27. The whole plan of redemption has been shown to us in its, in its fulfillment on Mount Calvary, where Jesus died, was buried, and raised. But there and there alone, we also have a pattern for living. Peter tells us, uh, hereunto were you called, <clears throat> because Christ also suffered for us. He has left an example for us that we should follow in his steps. Now, the pattern is heavenly. There is some pattern in heaven which was followed for the tabernacle. But it's also orderly. Because the pattern is heavenly, it must of necessity also be orderly. Such orderliness is evidenced in the physical structure as well as in the spiritual significance of the tabernacle. As we shall see in future messages, every single piece of the tabernacle and this amazing structure had its own place and purpose. For example, the, the, the stakes that were driven into the ground, exactly 50% under the ground 
50% above the ground, and the material that was chosen to hold the, the cords of the tabernacle fence will speak to us about a portion of the work of Christ. It's important to note that God began where men would end. In other words, let me see that uh, it's up there. Thank you. God uh, began where men would end. God began his conversation and his plans with the tabernacle, uh, uh, excuse me, the Ark of the Covenant in the holy place. That's because that's where God would come when he came down to dwell among his people. But for us, we would begin with the entrance on the eastern side, that 30-foot wide gate, uh, and we would proceed from there to the brazen altar, to uh, the, the laver, uh, into the table of showbread, which should be on the right side again, and the menorah on the left, the altar of incense before the veil, and then in the Holy of Holies. So we would go this way, God would come down and come through to meet us the opposite way. So when God lays it out, he begins with his pathway rather than man's pathway. Notice once again the words that have become basically a key text over these last weeks. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I will show them after the pattern of the tabernacle. And they shall make an ark. Why did the ark come first? Because it represented the person and the presence of God. And God should always come first as it relates to us as his people. So we learn from the pattern of the tabernacle very clearly as we'll go through this that God is a God of order. Y'all, he tells them exactly how to carry everything even the walls that are covered with gold over acacia wood on the inside of the holy place are all have rings on them and rods are run through them to keep those boards together. 20 boards on the, each side and six boards on the back held together like a solid wood co gold covered wooden wall. All of it is important. And it's more beautiful from the inside as to where someone on the outside cannot see the beauty of the whole. You've got to be inside to see the beauty, which isn't that kind of like our relationship with Christ? Somebody that's not in Christ doesn't really get a good glimpse into the beauty of the Lord and what the Christian life is all about. But once Christ is in us, the hope of glory, we see it as, as the glory of God dwelling in us and it's all the more beautiful. And so man looks down on this thing and they see badger skins and white linen where when we go in as in a priestly responsibility, there's gold, scarlet, blue, and all of these beautiful colors and, and different metals and, and fabrics and things. And so God tells us and teaches us through this that he's a God of order. In fact, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 14, 40, he said, let all things be done decently and in order. God's provision for the erecting of the tabernacle, they're the materials. Now again, y'all, this is a lot of very minute detail, but when you go through this study, it's all going to find its way into your heart and your understanding. The materials, God saw to it that his children, the children of Israel, came out of 400 years of bondage and slavery with all of the materials that would later be needed for the construction and erection of the tabernacle. His instruction to the people on the eve of their departure from Egypt for the promised land was this, Exodus 11:2. Let every man borrow from his neighbor, his Egyptian neighbor, and every woman of her neighbor, jewels of silver and jewels of gold. We also read in Exodus 12, 35 and 36, the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses, and they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver, jewels of gold and raiment, 
The Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that the Egyptians lent unto them such things as they required and they spoiled the Egyptians. Now the word borrow here literally means they asked the Egyptians for these things or they requested of them. It is so that in no way were the Israelites obligated to go back and pay back the Egyptians. No, they would have seen it. They were just merely requesting or asking for the payment that had been put off for what they had done for these folks for the last 400 years. So then comes the donation of the materials. In Exodus 35, 21, it said, They came, everyone whose heart stirred him up, and everyone whom his spirit made willing, and they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation and for all his service and for holy garments. So much was the abundance of giving, as we've already read, that Moses basically came to them and commanded, stop bringing this stuff. We've got more than enough. What we have here is evidence of true spirituality and liberality and the freedom of giving it is of the first importance to remember that everything that is offered to God must proceed from a heart made willing by God's Holy Spirit. In other words, for God to receive something as being a gift that is intent on worship, it must be spontaneous and it must not be the result of external uh, persuasion. The church of Christ would be in a very different state today if her giving were characterized by spirituality. Uh, I had uh, eight uh, trial injections in my back, I think it was last Monday, and uh, when I was sitting there waiting for the procedure, I was talking to a young lady I've had conversations with many times before. I'd established in one of the earlier conversations that she knows the Lord and has accepted Christ. Well, this time we talked about how things were going, and she said, Pastor, things are going great. She said, I don't know if I told you, but she said, I started tithing at the first of this year. I've never done it before. She said, our pastor challenged us last year to tithe in this year, 2024. And she said, I looked at all the numbers and I saw no way that I could do it and be able to make it for, with me. She's 34 and her uh, a son that's 15, a single, always a single mom. And uh, she said, I just didn't see how it worked. She said, but what I decided was he was preaching from the Bible, and if the Bible is God's word and it's truth, then I need to trust God no matter what it looks like on paper. And so she said, I decided I was going to tithe. My roommate, another lady, uh, was kind of mocking her, saying, how in the world do you think you're going to pay your rent, get your food, take care of your son, and do all of this? But what she said was, Pastor, not only have I not missed anything, she said, we somehow have extra every month, and we're able to do more than we've ever done before. She said, I don't know whether it's just there's some supernatural part of this, or if I'm just being a better money manager. I said, well, it's probably both. And so as we talked about it, she said, I'm committed to tithing from this point forward. And she said this, she said, I wish that I had done it sooner. And so what we need to understand is God's word is absolute truth. And when I said to her, I said, do you realize that the only time in the whole Bible that I'm aware of where God asked of us to test him is in Malachi chapter 3, where he's talking about the tithe, and he says, test me in this and see if I'll not open up the floodgates of heaven and pour out blessings. And that was in relationship to our tithing. I remember years ago at Johnson Ferry Baptist, when we were uh, encouraging people to tithe, a decision was made, we're going to ask everyone to tithe and tell folks that if after six months of giving, if they have not been blessed and find that they are better off, that we will in fact be willing to give them back everything they've contributed to the church. Y'all, the numbers skyrocketed in gifts, and you know what? No one asked for anything back. Everyone was convinced that it was wor the working of God that carried them along. So every man should give according to what he has purposed in his heart, Paul said, 
Uh, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, but God loves a cheerful giver, 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Nothing could be further from the truth than to suggest that the ministry of given, giving is purely a mundane matter unrelated to things of the Spirit, but rather it is extremely spiritual. Now, the spiritual-minded man or woman uh, has to say with David of old, but who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer so willingly all of this stuff for all things come of thee, have come from thee, and of thine own hand have we given. And so David was saying to the Lord, who are we that we can come back and give this much? But it all comes from you. And so just in the New Testament, when the people came together in the early church, it says they were together and they had all things in common. Uh, and they believed, all that believed were together, had all things in common, and they sold their possessions and goods and parted with them to all men as every man had a need. And so these people were generous in giving to the point that you heard me say. Moses said, stop, you've, you've piled it up. We've got more than enough. Uh, and so where did these people get this stuff? They got it from the people of Egypt. Uh, they got it from the people willingly giving them all of this stuff. God moved in their hearts. They were just ready for the people to move out. And so where do we get what we possess? God gives it to us. He gives it to us by his hand uh, through others and in various ways, our job, whether it's an inheritance, all of these different kinds of things. So with the donation of materials they received, I want you to think about the diversity of materials uh, that they had to give. Uh, they included metals, colors, fabrics, wood, oil, spices, and stones. Exodus 25, verses 3 through 7. And so there's great diversity in all of the things that they brought. Uh, most commentators that I've read on all of this agree on the symbolism, though there's possible that somehow we may have missed something, but basically here it is, the metals. Uh, if, if you're taking notes, think about this, the gold, three, three metals, gold, silver, brass, or bronze. There's, there's kind of some interchangeability here, but uh, you know, brass and bronze are copper with a different type of metal, uh, and that's what makes them different. Gold typifies the deity of Jesus Christ, Revelation 3.18, and his divine righteousness as seen in the mercy seat. Uh, when we think about Jesus and his deity, uh, he is God in the flesh. Uh, he took on the, the, the form of a man and came and dwelt among us, but he is God with us. And so gold speaks of the deity of Jesus Christ. What about silver? Silver typifies or symbolizes redemption as seen in atonement money. Numbers 18, 16 says, when they are a month old, you must redeem them at the redemption price set at five shekels of silver. So each person gave every year a portion of silver as a redemption uh, offering. And silver symbolized redemption. Now we're going to come back to this, but on top of every one of those acacia wood posts around that outer courtyard, there is a silver capstone, if I remember correctly. And so that says redemption, redemption, redemption. The whole thing is bound up in the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. And so if you see the silver on top of the post, the post is incorruptible, it does not decay, and it is holding up perfectly white uh, linen that is bright, which symbolizes righteousness. So in redemption, there's, I'm getting ahead of myself, I don't want to give it away today. Silver typifies redemption. It's hard not to go on into it. Uh, the brass, the bronze, it typifies, get this, the death of Jesus Christ. The stakes that are driven 50% in the ground, 50% out of the ground, that hold the cords, that hold the linen wall up, those are brass or bronze, symbolizing the death of Jesus Christ. So if it's 50% in the ground, what's that talking about? He's buried. 
If it's 50% out of the ground, he's raised. He's buried. He's raised. Every tent peg tells us he's buried. He's raised. All the way around. All throughout the whole. He's buried. He's raised. Which brings about for us redemption. It all going to come together. The colors, blue. It's a heavenly color. When you look into the heavens, the first heaven is the sky we see, uh, the blue. It typifies Jesus Christ as the spiritual one or the heavenly man. 1 Corinthians 15, 47 and 48 says the first man was of the dust of the earth. Who's that talking about? Adam. The second man is from heaven. He is a heavenly man. And then John 1, 18, no one has ever seen God, but God the one and only, or God the only begotten, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. Jesus, the heavenly man, has come to make God known among us. He was holy, he was harmless, he was undefiled, he was separate from sinners, and yet made higher than the heavens, Hebrews 7, 26. Now, purple. Purple typifies Jesus as the whole, uh, the as the sovereign one. It says in Revelation nineteen sixteen that on his thigh is written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Y'all, Jesus is the sovereign King of all eternity, and purple symbolizes the royal regal life of Jesus as the King of eternity. Before his crucifixion, you remember what happened? The soldiers mockingly clothed Jesus with purple and placed a crown of thorns on his head and put it above his head. They began to salute him, and they were mocking him, but all of it declared truth when they cried out, Hail him that is king of the Jews. You see the cloth declared he is the king. Their testimony said he is the king the crown of thorns declared he is the suffering king and as they saluted him there's a foreshadowing of every knee will bow and every tongue will confess and every army will submit to him as king hail jesus king of the jews the scarlet how often you've heard me say that there's a scarlet thread woven throughout the bible from genesis to the last of Revelation. Scarlet typifies Jesus Christ as the sacrificial one. The sacrificial color embodies the entire thought of redemption. In Isaiah 1, uh, the prophet says, Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And so when we think about that scarlet thread of redemption, Uh, It is that Jesus is the Redeemer. Rahab, the harlot, who helped the men of God, what kind of thread did she let down from the wall? A scarlet thread. There's the scarlet thread of redemption. The song of the redeemed that we will sing that is in Revelation, Thou art worthy, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us unto our God both kings and priests. In other words, the song of the redeemed is he is worthy and by his blood we are redeemed and by his blood he has made us into a holy nation and a kingdom of priests. Praise the Lord. Then we come to the fabrics. Fabrics? Oh yes. Fabrics speak also. There's fine linen. It speaks of righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He who knew no sin, Jesus, became sin that we might, you and me sinners, become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Y'all, we're talking about as we are Christians, we do not have a righteousness of our own, but a righteousness, as Romans says, that comes from God, and it is an imputed righteousness, I-M-P-U-T, ed it is input into us god has done that he makes us righteous jesus took our sin and he inputs his righteousness 
into us. We are made righteous as the sons and daughters of God by sanctification and redemption. You see, because of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God has made us unto wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. 1 Corinthians 1, 30. Y'all, this is a beautiful picture, but Jesus is coming one day, according to Zechariah, according to Revelation. He's going to be coming on a great white horse. He's going to come with the majesty and splendor of heaven, but in procession behind him, the saints of God will be gathered, all dressed in military regalia. No, we will be dressed in pure white linen, which speaks of righteousness, and he will be the one that gives testimony. We don't have to fight. He's the one that fights. He is the warrior of all warriors, and he needs no assistance in that final battle, for he will bring an end to the nations of the earth coming against Israel, and he will lead us in triumphant procession, dressed in white linen. You've heard me talk about what a Hershey's kiss melted in the sunlight will do to a white linen dress on Easter. Well, imagine we're coming in white linen behind the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and there will be no blemish. There will be no spots on our robes and our, of righteousness because he gives them to us, and he is the one who declares and defines them clean without blemish and pure. Goat's hair speaks of serviceableness. Garments of goat's hair were worn by prophets, Zechariah 13, 4 and 5. Then there's ram skins dyed red, speak of being devoted in a priestly office. Jesus was fully devoted to God. He was a perfect burnt offering, and he is making us with this ram skin in the tabernacle. He's, he's talking about being devoted in the priestly office and their work. The breast of a ram was waved before the Lord for the consecration of Aaron as a priest. Then there's the badger's skin, which speaks of holiness that repels every form of evil. From the outside, it wasn't that beautiful, but listen, it had a repelling nature about it that, that, it, that rain and the sun did not penetrate. Hebrews 7.26 says this, Such a high priest meets our need, one who is holy one who is blameless and pure, who set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Badger's skin. And you'll see how these all come together as four. The wood, acacia wood, it speaks of incorruptibility. The human nature of our Lord, incorruptible. In him there was no taint of corruption or sin. Luke said of him, that holy thing, talking to Mary, that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Then we come to oil. Typifies God's Holy Spirit, who is called in the New Testament the anointing. In 1 John 2.27, As for you, the anointing that you have received from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you, about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in him. Kings and priests and prophets, of which Jesus was all, were anointed with oil in the Old Testament. Spices. These typify the fragrance of Christ before God, 2 Corinthians 2, 14 and 15. But thanks be to God who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are, being, who are perishing. Stones, onyx and other precious stones typify the preciousness of God's people to him as seen in Christ. Malachi 3.17, on that day... When I act, says the Lord Almighty, they will be my treasured possession. I will spare them just as the Father has compassion and spares his Son who serves him. All right, I'm going to take a breath and a sip of water. Now the measures of the tabernacle, okay? 
You're going to learn all of this as we dig into this. The stones, you're going to hear the wood, the fabrics, the metals, uh, all of these things you'll be very familiar with by the time we finish. What about the measures of the tabernacle? The number three. This speaks of abundant testimony. Matthew 18, 16 says, So we have this testimony of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. When we hear in Isaiah chapter 6, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We're hearing an abundant, emphatic testimony that emphasizes all that we see in Jesus Christ, that he is holy. This abundant testimony is illustrated in numerous threes throughout the whole construction of the tabernacle. There are three sections of the tabernacle, the courtyard, the holy place, and the holy of holies. There are three metals in the construction, gold, silver, brass, or bronze. There are three liquids employed in the service of the tabernacle, blood, water, and oil. Three colors in the curtains, blue, purple, and scarlet. Three types of sacrifices, offerings of the herd, bulls, offerings of the flock, for example, sheep or goats, offerings of the fowls, turtle doves, or pigeons, and so on. Threes are very prominent. Number four. Four speaks of that which is universal. The four winds of the earth, Ezekiel 37, 9. Or the four corners of the earth, Isaiah eleven twelve. Look for the four coverings of the tabernacle. There is the four square brazen altar, the four horns on the altar. There are four pillars holding up the hanging gate of the outer court. There are four spices in the holy anointing oil. Four is speaking of the universal work of God in redemption. The number five speaks of human responsibility. Think about it. We have five fingers on each hand which speak of our, uh, our frame denoting human responsibility in our work. We have five toes on each foot. That speaks of our responsibility in our Christian walk. We have five senses denoting our human responsibility in receiving and being receptive to the things of God. Five is also understood to signify the grace of God, for example, as he provides his grace. The number seven, well, before seven, you've got to have six. The number six denotes the height of human attainment. You cannot attain but so much as a human. Uh, you are limited in how far you can go. However, we must remember that even our best attempts fall short of God's glory or of perfection. But seven speaks of divine completion, divine perfection. Seven was the number of golden candlesticks. Seven was the number of items that furnished inside the courtyard of the tabernacle, the furniture, the ark, the mercy seat, the table of showbread, the golden candlestick, the brazen altar, the brazen laver, and the golden altar of incense. Then there's the number 12, speaks of administration. 12 is the number of months in a year. 12 is the number of tribes in Israel. 12, the number of disciples in the kingdom of God. 12 is the number of loaves of the showbread table, setting forth God's administration and support and maintenance of the people. 12 was the number of stones, obviously representing the 12 tribes, the stones representing the people on the on the epod of the, of the breastplate of the high priest. Then there's the number 40, and we're almost done. 40 is the compound of 10 times 4 and speaks of the full measure of man's responsibility to God and to man. It sets forth the full measure of probation and testing. 40 years of testing in the wilderness. Moses knew 40 years of, of, of training. In other places, we find 40 years. Uh, much more can be said about the symbology of Bible numbers, but today we're going to let this suffice to illustrate the simple kinds of things that we're going to be looking for in our study of the tabernacle. And so, the erecting of the tabernacle, uh, the materials, the measurements, and the ministry of these materials and measurements in the kingdom of God. Ultimately, all again about the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. And so the more we know of this, the more we're able to interpret 
the New Testament, especially books like Hebrews and those things which speak of the Jewish law to help us understand what's taking place. And by the way, when we think about the tabernacle and the Holy Spirit coming to fill, again, there's the cross at the gate, through the altar, through the laver, through the middle of the candlestick and the showbread, the upright all the way to the Holy of Holies, uh, and then the crossbar at the table of showbread, the menorah. And there we have, for those that are in Christ, inside the courtyard, in Christ, they have all the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in them. And then we have this promise that we will forever be the sons and daughters of God. And he makes us into a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a chosen people. Uh, and he keeps us for all eternity. And it offers us a great word of hope that we can put our trust and faith in Jesus Christ. And y'all, the world may look down on us and say, this makes no sense. But when you're in Christ and you see all of this, it makes great sense. And it's, uh, it's hard not to believe what God has said. Yesterday, as I was standing again at the cemetery, I've had the, officiated three additional funerals this week. Uh, I'm repeating 1 Thessalonians 4 about those who have fallen asleep. And I said again, as I always do, do I believe this? Absolutely. If I did not believe it, I wouldn't be standing here. Do I believe all these numbers and colors and types and what they speak about the kingdom of God? Absolutely. Or again, I wouldn't be here. And I hope you wouldn't be here if you didn't believe it. But what we've been given is the precious, living, and active word of God that is absolute truth that we can trust at every moment in our life to give us wisdom, discernment, and direction for our days both now and forevermore. Let's pray together.